morning, everybody. It's good to be able to be together and to see all of you again. I'm particularly excited this morning because as we've been announcing for some time, we're starting a new series this week on Why Believe is the title of the entire series. And the ultimate goal of the series is to try to lay side by side what we might def- describe as the uh, biblical worldview with the sort of modern, scientific, secular age uh, view of reality. And we want to compare and contrast these two visions of reality. And I believe that as we do so, we will be informed about a lot of things, but most of all, we will come to see and appreciate more clearly the value of what we as believers hold dear. And if you're not a believer, if you're not a Christian, and you're thinking about these things from a skeptical distance, I hope to fairly represent the other side such that it would be recognized by those who espouse it and show why I think there are flaws in that system and why I think Christianity does provide a superior understanding and way of life to the secular model that's being set forth in the world today. First, what we want to do, and really the first three lessons focus on this, is to try to clear away some what philosophers call defeater beliefs. Those are beliefs that people hold that sort of give them um, a basis to say, I don't really even need to give any consideration whatsoever to the, to the claims of Christianity because I think something else just completely dismisses it as being a valid uh, system of thought or way of life or religion or however you want to describe it. And the first of those is the question, why should I believe if science basically can explain everything? And that is a point of view that many people have, that everything that can be explained can be explained by the application of the scientific method. There are actually very few scientists who would make that kind of claim, but I have in my research encountered a couple of scientists. One was sort of this old school British hard-boiled atheist and And when asked certain questions that science couldn't answer, his response to that was, well, that's just not a good question. So I suppose if you rule out all questions that science can't answer, you could say by a tautology that science can answer every question. But I think most people know that there are limits to science, and certainly most scientists agree with that. And you may be wondering before we get into this morning's lesson why I, a preacher, am going to address the question of science and science and its intersection with religion and faith. And that's a good question. Uh, It would probably have been better to have Durrell or some other expert come in who has a deeper background in science to address this. But I would assure you that I I know a little bit about science. I I have Avogadro's number. I have it in my phone. I, I will admit that when I I call, he doesn't answer, and he doesn't reply to my texts, uh, but I do follow him on Twitter, so I know a little bit about science. <clears throat> but with that uh, bit of humor uh, aside, the place that I want to jump in uh, with this this morning is by simply uh, admitting something as a Christian. As a Christian, there are some things that I and that probably you believe that are, I would say, not necessarily easy things to believe. And that some people standing from outside the Christian worldview look at and say, well, that's just unbelievable. And some of those things include stuff like an uncreated creator. And this is a question that children bring up pretty early in their development as they think about these kinds of things. And they ask when we tell them that God created the heavens and the earth and that God made them, they ask eventually the question, what? You can help me out. Who made God? Who made God? Well, if God made everything, who made God? And that's, that's an interesting question. And what we affirm as Christians is that he is the uncaused cause. That he's the one thing in all of reality that sort of stands outside of time and space and isn't dependent on his being from anything else. He is not a derived being. And that that's what makes him, by definition, in part, God. He is in a unique class because everything else that we know comes from something else. And so it's a logical, reasonable question. 
But we as Christians believe that there is not an infinite regression of causes that just goes on forever that that you could never reach the beginning of, but that there was a prime mover, an original cause who was not caused or made himself. So we believe that, and you may find that difficult to believe. For others, to me, it actually makes better sense than the infinite regression of, of, of caused causes. But there's another thing that we believe as Christians. We believe in heaven, and heaven is a realm, I like to think of it really using scientific terminology, is sort of like another dimension of existence or realm that is not accessible, at least by our five senses, to us as human beings. And yet we believe that it really is there, and that it's, as it were, a a place, a realm in which God lives, in which there are angels and other beings, and it's something that we hope that when we die that our spirit is able to enter into this particular realm that is very difficult for us to define, and admittedly so. But we believe in heaven. And we also believe in miracles. That is, that this creator God who made everything can, I think one way of putting it, input new information into the system, if you will, to cause something to happen that is not expected in the orderly flow of natural events and cause and effect, but that at certain points in time in history, he has revealed his hand in nature to do something that is beyond the mere natural order of events. And we also believe in the ultimate miracle, and that is that Jesus is God in the flesh. That this eternally existent, uncaused cause, God himself, who exists beyond time and space, came into, entered into time and space, entered into his creation, his story, and lived as a human being just like you and I. That he lived, was born, that he died, was buried, and that he rose again and lives forever. And so these are things that I understand if you didn't grow up in a Christian worldview at all, and you were exposed to these things, you would say, that's hard for me to believe. And I get that. And I think as Christians, one of the things we have to come to grips with as we interact with other people who aren't believers and who aren't familiar with the reasons why we think these things are reasonable is we need to appreciate the perspective that an unbeliever would come from and why he would find those things difficult to believe. But I've done that in part to, to create a back door for those of you who may be of a more secular bent and suggest that there are some things that you believe likely that are kind of out there, to be honest with you, a little bit difficult to believe. It's not just Christians that have some strange ideas, but you perhaps do as well, especially if you are an, of an atheistic secular bent. And those would include the idea that nothing created everything. The atheist that I mentioned before, the hard-boiled British atheist, uh, he is a, a, a chemist, and he, he in a debate with a, a, a believer, kept referring to this when asked about it, and, and he would, with his best British accent and very dignified manner, and with uh, a, a mannerism, would say, well, you see, nothing rolled over into something. And he could do it so well with his British accent that you sort of, it's kind of like a Jedi mind trick. You sort of like, oh, I see now because nothing rolled over into something. But it's hard to explain. And, and the, the, the world's leading cosmologist and astrophysicist would, would agree that this, this is difficult. They, they feel like with the forces of nature that they have understood over the last 50 or so years that they can kind of get back, as it were, in time to the, to the split second before or after, rather, the, the Big Bang as they understand the origin of the universe. But moving beyond that to what was it exactly before and what laws were in operation before that, they say is utterly a mystery, and many of them admit that it's likely a mystery never to be solved. But virtually all of them agree that there was a time that when space was so tightly curved in on itself that there was literally nothing. 
that sort of inexplicably became something that has eventually turned into everything. And they also believe, and if you are of this bent, you think that non-life created life. That inanimate and inorganic materials, chemical compounds, somehow gathered the information. And we now understand, and Darwin had no idea about this, but now understand that biological life and DNA and all of that is like code. It's a language. It's a message. And it's actually the longest word in the world. And it is very precisely written language. And how that language came to be and how inanimate, inorganic material first sprang to life Well, again, that's something that is extraordinarily difficult to conceive of or explain, even from the most advanced scientific minds. You also believe that non-consciousness created consciousness, that that which wasn't self-aware became self-aware as a result of an unguided process, and that's a tough thing to explain. Again, there's mysteries about what consciousness is that neuroscientists are still grappling with and trying to make sense of. And one more, and this is of a little bit different category, but if you are a serious secular atheist, you acknowledge, and most of the modern atheists, the new atheists as they refer, are referred to, will readily admit this, that morality, meaning, ethics, and even free will are not real. They're all made up. They're all in your imagination. That there is no objective right and wrong, justice, just a purely human construct. And that while you seem to feel like your life has meaning, and maybe you can generate some short-term temporal meaning while you're here, there, there really is no meaning to the universe. It came from nothing. It's here for no reason, and it's headed to a heat death some point in the future, and then no one will know you were ever here or remember you or anything you or your children or your grandchildren ever did. And even this idea that you make choices and that you do things by the dictates of your free will is actually just an illusion as well, because it's all simply chemical processes that have inevitably unfolded from that very moment of the Big Bang till this present. Everything that has happened has happened because the laws at work in nature have predetermined that that's the way it would be. And so there's some pretty crazy things that you believe if you're an atheist, secularist-minded person. And so we, we come to this sort of awkward spot, I think. We, we find ourselves in a bit of a fix here because everyone, whether you're a Christian or whether you're a non-Christian, believes something that just sort of seems at least to other people to be unbelievable. I like the way author N.D. Wilson puts this in uh, his, his book, uh, Notes from the Tilt-A-Whirl, which is uh, a reference to planet Earth spinning on its axis while it's going thousands of miles an hour in its orbit around the sun. And that's, that's our life on the Tilt-A-Whirl. And he makes this point in that book. He says, you are not going to find an easy-to-believe explanation for an impossible-to-believe world. And that's one of the really wonderful things about the modern scientific movement is it has revealed to us some just amazing things about this world that we live in, about the human body and the human mind. And as we explore the depths of it, we come to this this feeling of, of absolute awe about the wonder and amazement of the reality of the of the creation that we live in. And it's exactly as he says, there's just not going to be any simple, easily believed explanation for an impossible to believe world. But yet, here we are. And so one of the really good things that I think we could do is instead of posing questions like, prove that God exists, or just as difficult to do, prove that God doesn't exist. These, neither of these are really fair ways of phrasing the debate. I think it would be much more of a level playing field if we started something like this. 
reality exists, this unbelievable world and our unbelievable bodies and minds and the reality that you and I, whether we're secularists or whether we're Christians or whether or whatever we are, can agree on exists. It's here, it's real, and we're a part of it. What is the best explanation for it? So given the reality that we find ourselves in, what explanation makes the most sense of everything? I'd like to begin answering that question by again citing one of the foremost atheists of our generation, Richard Dawkins, probably known to all of you. In his book, The God Delusion, describes the reality that we inhabit this way and how it has come to be. He says, on one planet, referring to the earth, and possibly only one planet, we'll get to that a little bit later, on one planet in the entire universe, molecules that would normally make nothing more than a complicated chunk of rock gather themselves together And when I first read this, I thought he was sort of making fun of his position, but this is his position. This is his explanation for for the reality that we find ourselves in, that these inorganic, uncomplex collections of rock gathered, think about it, the rocks gathered themselves together with no outside intervention No intelligent mind operating on it. No no teleological purpose in mind for why they were doing this. They, They just rocks gathered themselves together into chunks. And again, I'm not making fun of this. This is one of the foremost atheistic scientists alive today gathered itself together into chunks of rock sized matter of such staggering complexity that they are capable of running and jumping, swimming, flying, seeing, hearing, capturing and eating each other, uh, eating yet other chunks of complex matter. That's all the things that they, they can do. Um, including, he says, falling in love, which by the way, happy Valentine's Day. You may turn to your um, amazing collection of rock turned into life sitting next to you and compliment them on their, the proportionality of their complex lump of matter. But this is what we refer to as a bottoms-up view of reality. A bottoms-up view of reality that, that nothing created something that gathered itself into ultimately human form with a consciousness capable of love and the works of Michelangelo and Bach, and did all of that by a mindless, unguided process. Now, the Christian view goes something like this. That's, that's one explanation. The Christian explanation goes something like this, and I refer, admittedly, to an author who is much, much, much less technologically advanced than Mr. Dawkins, but nevertheless, Moses, in the very first verse of the Hebrew Scriptures, said, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And he also says in verse 27 of that same chapter that God created mankind in his own image, something special and unique about the human race. Made in the image of God, he created the male and female he created them. In Romans chapter 1 and verse 20, the apostle Paul puts it like this. He says, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible quality. So he's acknowledging that God is not measurable by scientific methods. He's the invisible God, but he says there's certain qualities about God since the creation that we can perceive and that we're responsible for noticing. And he says they are these, his eternal power and divine nature, that there must have been this prime mover, this uncaused cause who has brought everything that we see and experience into being. And then we can clearly see that 
understanding it by what has been made. So I want you to notice that the Apostle Paul's view of faith in this God it's not a blind leap into dark. I, I, just, I just believe and I have no evidence or reason for believing. But rather it's reasoned and logical. It's a inference that he draws from what he observes. He looks around and sees something that exhibits order and design and beauty and morality and consciousness. And he says, you know, I think that clearly points to a creator, a mind, a spirit that preceded this. So this would be a top down versus a bottom up view that it all began with a mind, an intelligence, a personal rational intelligence that created and ordered the creation in such a way as these things that we exist, that we observe and are a part of our existence uh, can be accounted for. So he brought the universe into existence by speaking it into being and then spoke order into it by inputting information. And this makes sense because it means that the laws of nature have what every law that we know anything about has, and that is what? A lawgiver. That's what we're saying. We're not disputing the laws of nature. We're not, you know, finding fault with the four fundamental laws of physics. But we're saying that those laws have what every law that we know anything else about has in common, and that is that there was a law giver. Now, the founders of the modern scientific movement, men like Newton and Boyle and Maxwell and Faraday and Kepler, were all Christians. They were all devout believers. And it's argued by the historians of science that that belief in God was what gave rise to the modern scientific movement. They believed that if nature had a lawgiver, that it would therefore operate by laws that they could discover. And that's exactly what I think we would expect. In fact, all the way back in Proverbs 25 and verse 2, it says that the glory of God, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter, to search out a matter is the glory of kings, or in this case, scientists, people who have the ability and opportunity to examine and to think and to ponder and to research are invited by God himself to look into his handiwork, to explore his creation and uncover or discover the laws, the operative laws that are at work in that nature. And it is a glorious thing for man to be able to do this. Why are we able to do this? Because we have rational minds created in the image of a rational God who created a universe with reliable laws at work that we could see in operation and and come to have an understanding of. And perhaps the greatest uh, or most well-known and fundamental of all scientific papers ever written, the Principia Mathematica by Sir Isaac Newton, said in the preface that he hoped that people, upon reading his work, would see the glory of God revealed in the language of mathematics. Now, that takes us directly, I believe, to the question at hand. Can science explain everything? Well, I think quite obviously, no. It cannot tell us why we are here or what we should be doing while we're here, along with any number of other questions. And that is not to disparage science. Science is a powerful, powerful tool and powerful to explain many, many things. But here's what many people do not understand. And that is that there can be more than one explanation of a particular thing and both of those explanations be true. Let me say that again. I think some people think that because science and because science can explain things, that it therefore rules out the God explanation of anything. That the two contradict each other in some fundamental way. And that simply isn't the case. Let me see if I can use an illustration by Professor John Lennox, a professor of mathematics at Oxford. He uses this illustration. I've heard him use it a number of times. 
He says, ask this question. Why is there water boiling in the kettle on the stove? And he says one very good scientific explanation for that would be that the heat from the stove top, whether it's a gas or in this case electric stove, is, is uh, being transferred through the conductive copper base of the kettle in such a way that it excites the molecules of water inside to the point that it finally breaks surface tension given whatever atmospheric conditions you're in and you have boiling water, boiling water explained. And that's a perfectly proper and true definition or explanation of what's going on. But there's another explanation that doesn't contradict it at all. In fact, it's necessary in order to have a fuller picture of what's going on. And he says that is that Dr. Lennox wants a cup of tea. <laughs> That's why water's boiling in the kettle. And you see, those two explanations don't contradict. They fill each other out. And both of them are a part of what we should be pursuing as Christians in our attempts to, or as humans, as our attempts to understand the world in which we're living. And so why does the universe exist? Well, you can say because of the laws of physics and Principles of chemistry, biology. But you could also say that they exist to display the glory of God. Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament reveals his handiwork. God wanted to reveal in time and space what and who he is in eternity. And so he created. And those two definitions in no way contradict one another. The fact that your mechanic can explain to you the internal combustion engine, the electrical system, the drive system of your automobile with perfect, uh, with perfect detail, sufficient to explain how this car goes down the road, does not rule out an explanation of Henry Ford or other engineers that may have been behind the planning and creation and building of your automobile. And so, going on to think about this, Professor Lennox adds this point. He says, the more that we get to know about our universe, the more the hypothesis that there is a creator gains in credibility as the best explanation of why we are here. Now, what I'd like to do in the few moments that we have remaining is share some things that I gleaned from an op-ed that's the most shared op-ed in the Wall Street Journal's history that sort of explains one of the ways in which we've learned more about our universe that hasn't squeezed God out to the margins, but really brings God more and more to the center of the discussion. And that there are more and more people, I think, coming to realize that. It takes a little bit of history to explain this, but we'll begin in 1966. That was the year that Time Magazine published the question, is God dead? In that same year, astronomer Carl Sagan announced in his work, The Cosmos, in which he said, the cosmos is all that there ever was, is, or ever will be. He announced that there were two necessary criteria for a planet to support life. It required the right kind of star and a planet the right distance from that star. And based on those criteria, he estimated that there were a septillion, that is one followed by 24 zeros, of planets in the universe that would be capable of supporting life. And in part as a result of what he affirmed there, the United States government launched the SETI program, the search for extraterrestrial intelligence. But then in 1993, nearly 30 years after Sagan's original prediction, Congress defunded SETI. It continues on through some private funding, but the Congress defunded SETI because after its extensive search for signs of intelligent life out there returned exactly zero results. So the question is, what happened between 1966 and 1993 
that decreased this expectation that we should be hearing something from intelligent life in space. Well, as our knowledge of the universe increased, the number of factors necessary for life to exist on any given planet began to decrease. It went from Sagan's two criteria to 10 to 20 to as many as, depending on how you go about tabulating and and, and accounting for these things, as many as 200 specific criteria that are necessary for carbon-based life to exist in this world, in this universe. And the mathematical probability for those planets capable of sustaining life began to approach zero. In other words, the odds turned against any planet in the universe being able to support life, including this one, the planet Earth. We, in other words, shouldn't be here, but yet here we are. And not only here existing, but talking about existence and what it all means. And so the writer of this article begins to ask some questions near the conclusion. He says, can every one of these many parameters have been made perfect by accident? And at what point is it fair to admit that we cannot be the result of random forces? Doesn't assuming that an intelligence created these perfect conditions require far less faith than believing that a life-sustaining earth just happened to beat the inconceivable odds to come into being? But there's more than that. The fine-tuning of our solar system and the planet Earth in order to sustain life is really nothing, literally nothing, in comparison to the odds of the universe existing at all. And I know that this kind of starts getting out beyond what most of us are able to really grasp very well. But we're all familiar, at least on some level, with the four fundamental laws of physics, the the gravitational force, the electromagnetic force, the strong and weak nuclear forces. But what physicists have come to understand is that those four forces and the constants that are assigned to them have to be exactly what they are in themselves and in relation to each other, or the universe could not either have formed nor could it continue to exist. It would if in the slightest, and by, by slightest, I, I'm talking, you know, those quintillion type numbers, the slightest degree, if gravity were just the slightest degree stronger or weaker than it is, especially in relation to the electromagnetic force, the universe would simply come to pieces. Fred Hoyle who coined the term Big Bang, said that his atheism was, quote, greatly shaken at these developments. And he later wrote that a common sense interpretation of the facts suggests that a super intellect has monkeyed with the physics, as well as with the chemistry and biology. The numbers, he goes on to say, that one calculates from the facts seems to me so overwhelming as to put this conclusion almost beyond question. And the theoretical physicist, Paul Davies, has said that the appearance of design in the universe is overwhelming. Now, as a Christian, I believe that God is the author who wrote the fundamental laws of physics, and that in doing so, he has left his fingerprints all over creation. And this is what the Scripture says refers to as well when it says we can infer his existence from the things that he has made. Now, I want to set that before you and then conclude with with just a little bit more that gets specifically into the biblical message itself. Richard Dawkins, again, in The God Delusion, I think it was in The God Delusion, or one of his books, he makes this statement about faith, referring specifically to religious faith or Christian faith in particular. He says, faith is belief without evidence and reason. Coincidentally, that's also the definition of delusion. Yeah, this was from his book, The God Delusion. If you believe in God, you're, you're in a delusion. And he says that, you know, faith is just belief without evidence. And unfortunately, I have encountered any number of Christians in my lifetime who agree with that statement. You know, you just believe. 
in spite of the evidence or without any evidence, you just, you just decide, well, I'm gonna, I, I know there's no reason for it, but I just decided I, I want there to be a God, and so I'm going to believe in a God. Well, we, we've shown that that's not necessary. And it's certainly not why people like Professor Lennox that we've referred to a couple of times have great faith in God and believe in Jesus Christ, not in spite of the evidence, but because as a scientist and mathematician, as he looks at the evidence, it speaks to him about the necessity of a lawgiver, of a creator, of a designer. And that's what we're trying to show this morning is that we're looking at the evidence We're looking at the reality that we live in, and we're saying, what's the best explanation? And you can see that there are reasons to believe. Now, I'm not saying I've made an airtight, ironclad case that you now have to believe and that there's no way that I could possibly be wrong. I'm not suggesting that, but I am saying I have definitely not done this. I'm not just believing because there's no evidence and I just decided I was going to believe anyway. That's not the Christian faith, at least. And so, does Dawkins' affirmation about what Christians do, this blind faith or leap of faith business, does that square with what God asks us to do? And I think it does not. Taking for just as one example before we close, the Gospel of John, this is a concluding part, portion of, of his gospel. And it's sort of his thesis statement as to why he wrote the book of John, which is a biography of the life of Jesus. And in this biography, John selects seven miracles, which he calls signs, because they are pointers indicating something about the one performing them. Seven miracles that Jesus performed that revealed that he was who he claimed to be, the Son of God. The Logos, the Word made flesh. And as he lays out that evidence and those seven signs, then he comes to this conclusion. He says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. So it's not that these are the only things that Jesus did. He says in another place, if you try to record everything that Jesus did, the world couldn't contain the books that could be written. But I've selected these seven signs recorded in this book for this reason. He says, these are written that you may believe that. And I've highlighted the word that because you believe that something before you believe in something. And what he wants us to believe is that Jesus is the Messiah. I've given you evidence so that you can believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God. I've provided that evidence for you, and here's the testimony that you can consider and reason and think through whether or not you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, not take a blind leap of faith, but consider the evidence and come to the conclusion. And that after you believe that something is true about Jesus, you can now do something else you can believe in. You believe that he's the son of God and now you trust in him with your life. And maybe on some level you can call that a leap of faith, a step into trust and loyalty to the one who has revealed and proven himself to be worthy of your trust. So you believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the son of God that you may, and that by believing you may have life in his name. And that's a wonderful thing to think about. It's where I want to close. And it's something that's verifiable. Now, it's not scientific because it's personal and experiential, but that doesn't mean it isn't true. You see, I, I want to testify before you this morning that I have found what John hoped for. I've read the Gospel of John I've considered the seven signs, especially the overwhelming evidence that Jesus rose from the dead. And I know that's hard to believe, but you should at least consider the evidence before you blindly dismiss it. I've believed that Jesus is the Son of God, and because of that, I've trusted in Him, and I've found life in His name. And I can tell you my life today 
is nothing like what my life would be had I not trusted in Jesus. He promises peace with God. I've found that. I don't live in fear that God is trying to get me or is going to destroy me because the guilt and the wrongs that I've committed have been taken away through what Jesus accomplished for me on the cross. And I have joy and I have hope. And I've learned how to treat other people in a way that I don't think I would have ever treated them if it were just Lawrence by himself. Whatever good you see in me, let it be a tribute to the one who has transformed me, who has loved me and gave himself for me and who I'm trying to follow after. And so I think by a variety of lines of evidence, the Christian worldview makes the most sense of the reality that I find myself experiencing. And I know that in one lesson like this, if you've come here with skepticism and doubts, it's not going to provide all that you need, but it's a starting place. And I hope that it will be that starting place for you and that you'll keep coming back or listening if you're watching online to hear the rest of this series in which we will try to talk about these kinds of things and lay side by side the secular worldview and the biblical Christian worldview. And maybe, just maybe, you also will find life in his name. If you're not a Christian and you know what you need to do in response to him, we encourage you to come now while we stand and while we sing.